Good morning, brethren. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it interesting how all these volumes dovetail together as you go through them? So I'm going to do the atonement, or at one minute, between God and man. Uh, Webster's Dictionary says atonement, reparation or expiation, the recompense for sin typified by the sufferings and death of Christ. Okay, synonyms. Expiation, propitiation, reconciliation, reparation, satisfaction. Now, however the word atonement may be viewed, it is conceded that its use at all is between God and man implies a difficulty, a difference, an opposition existing between the creator and the creature. Otherwise, it would be as one. And there would be no need of a work of atonement from either standpoint. Now, when God sentenced Father Adam to death, he very properly said nothing about repentance, for he offered Adam no hope of a future life. Only vaguely was any hope hinted at when God told the serpent Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and your seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. In Eden, God would have eventually allowed Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit of knowledge, and they remain faithful. If then no hope for a future life was known to Adam or revealed to him, why should God deal with him at all? Adam was sent to death and destruction. There is no basis upon which to command a man to repent unless something is offered as a reward for repentance. Now God put Adam, God put upon Adam the sentence of death, which could only be removed by payment of a ransom price. God fully intended that someday all mankind should have an opportunity of coming into harmony with him and of having another trial or judgment for life. But it was not his due time to explain his program. Therefore, Adam lived and died without any command to repent, and so did his children. I ran across something Pastor Russell wrote in one of the towers, incidentally, that Adam lived 930 years, and uh, they don't know of his accomplishment. His brain was probably like a computer. Pastor Russell said probably his accomplishments were all wiped away in the flood, so it made me have great accomplishments being so, being so near perfect. Now in Jude 14 and 15, the first intimation of what God <coughs> might do, <coughs> excuse me, was given by the prophet Enoch, but the revelation made by Enoch was not a sufficient basis for offering hope to mankind, nor for telling them to repent. Here's that, what that says in Jude 14 and 15. And Enoch, also the same from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all of that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, <clears throat> So years passed by until the time of Abraham. Then God told Abraham that he would reveal a secret to him, <coughs> excuse me, because Abraham was his friend. The secret was not a message to be preached, but to be believed by himself and by those who would be his heirs of that promise, which was not yet applicable to any outside of Abraham's descendants. The secret was, in thee and thy seed shall all of the nation families of the earth be blessed. Genesis 28, 14. God said, I intend to bless the world, Abraham. If you are obedient to my instruction, your seed will get the blessing and transmit it to the world in general. It was only by implication, therefore, that Abraham had any suggestion that a life of repentance would be rewarded. Now, right to life is one thing, but right to eternal life is another. Adam had right to live life, but would have been, a, but have been right, Adam had the right to live, but which would have been eternal if by obedience he had demonstrated his worthiness to live forever. So what the ancient worthies, those like Abraham, whom the Bible declares the world was not worthy of. These, were, these, when raised from the dead, they will have the right to live, but only through the mediator. They will have no life, life rights of their own. 
For there are no life rights except those that are recognized by the Father and justice. Now the Apostle Paul tells us that already they have the divine approval, but although they please God, he did not give them eternal life. And although they shall please the mediator, he will not turn them over to justice until the end of the millennial day. Now in due time, God called the children of Israel and dealt with them through Moses. Practically, he said, do you wish to be my people? If so, come now and enter into a covenant with me. I will be your God, and you shall be my people. We, uh, we, we remember that the children of Israel came about through Abraham's grandson, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Now Israel was not commanded to repent, nor were any of the rest of the world. It was an invitation, not a command. God was ready to make a covenant with them, the covenant was that they were to obey the law God gave them through Moses. And by their obedience to the Ten Commandments and the spirit of the covenant, they would become God's people. But when they tried to keep the law, they found they could not do so because of inherited weakness. They had their opportunity and they failed. At this time, about 4,000 years had passed already from Adam's creation, trial, and death sentence. In the book of Daniel, verses 2, 3, uh, we are 35, a prophecy was made as to what the world's condition would be during those 4,000 years. Now Daniel had interpreted a dream of King, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon that foretold of four universal empires, just depicted by a man with a head of gold, breast of arms, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron and feet, partly iron and clay. <clears throat> and then a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it smote the image on its feet of iron and clay and break them in pieces. Then the iron and clay, the bronze, silver, and gold all together were broken to pieces and became like the chaff of the, on the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away so that there was not a trace could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now secular history <coughs> verifies that these four universal kingdoms during these 4,000 years were Babylon, Beta Persia, Greece and Rome, Greece and Rome. And Rome was broken up into 10 smaller kingdoms and not much of them exists. Left. Now another prophecy in Daniel states that in the days of these kings, the God of heaven would set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. It was at this time the Roman Empire, the last of these empires, was still ruling the world. The Jews of Palestine were under their yoke. These Jews, though through their scripture, had long looked for Messiah, in Luke 3.15 reads. And as the people were in expectation, and all men knew in their hearts of John whether he was Christ or not. Now during these days, a momentous event for the human race took place. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 4.4 4 writes, But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. When Jesus came, he kept the law and inherited all the promises of the law of covenant. Then he offered a share in the kingdom which God had promised to set up, and blessings, honor, and glory to as many of the Jews who would come into harmony with him. <clears throat> in substance, he said, This is the way. Trust in me and walk in my footsteps. Then ye shall be my disciples. He shall share in my sufferings now and by and by in the glory of my kingdom. In due time, after a certain number had been gathered from the Jews, the message was extend, extended to all Gentiles who were, who were in the right condition of heart. Why should God deal with the Gentiles now when he had refused to deal with them before? The explanation of this new condition is that Christ had died and God's great plan had now matured enough to be applicable to all men everywhere. 
God had appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness. The Gentile, not having indicated a desire to come back into harmony with God, as the Jewish nation had done, God commanded them everywhere to repent. This he did through those who were representatives of his teaching, the apostles and the church. Now we remember the Apostle Paul's great sermon on the Mars Hill to the people of Athens. That's in Acts 17, 22 to 24. And I'll quote, Apostle Paul said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in everything you are very religious, for as I passed along and observed the object of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship, as unknown, this I proclaim unto you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in shrines made by man, nor is he served by human hand, <clears throat> as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all men life and breath and everything. And then in verse 30, the apostle tells them, The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands men, all men everywhere, to repent. And verse 31 says, Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead. The King James Version says that the times of ignorance God winked at, which means the same as overlooked. So for 4,000 years, God had allowed mankind to free reign under four universal empires. Even before the flood of Noah days, God had permitted the angels to attempt to better mankind, and this proved disastrous. Now in times past, God acted as he did not notice when sin was committed, unless it was a grievous sin. Then he merely took the lives of the sinners under unpleasant conditions. The prophet Ezekiel said that God took all the sodomites away as he saw good. Ezekiel. 1650. At that time, God had sent no command to the sodomites to repent, so God merely winked, overlooked at the ignorance of sin at that time. Now, reconciliation with God, atonement with him, was impossible until first the rejection had been secured by the precious blood, that the one seeking atonement might approach God through the mediator of the new covenant. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father by me. John 14, 6. Now God had appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Acts 17, 30, 30 and 31 says, That great day is the next age, the day of Christ, the day of Messiah's kingdom. God has made this provision for the redemption of all through the death of Christ. Mankind were all under the death sentence, and God could not deal with them unless the sentence was lifted. He has not annulled the death sentence, but he has provided a ransom for all. 1 Timothy 2.6 Whoever knows of this plan of redemption knows that God intends to give every individual of Adam's race an individual trial for life. That trial will not be merely to determine whether mankind will try to be right and battle against evil influences of the world, but God will subdue sin and uplift all of Adam's race who are desirous of being uplifted. God has declared that no member of Adam's race after resurrected need die. Everyone who will may return to God through the great atonement to be affected by the Redeemer. The world's blessing will consist of an awakening from the tomb, and there will be an opportunity to rise out of these sinful and fallen conditions. And if they will, to return to full harmony with God and have everlasting life in a, a glorious judgment day of a thousand years. Now those who learn the lessons now and appreciate them to the full will be given no further trial. Those who haven't had a sufficiency of opportunity will have a full trial in the age to come under the discipline, the chastenings, and the rewards of that time. They will learn how much better is righteousness than sin. They will develop into character likeness of God, which Adam lost, and will see the exceedingly sinfulness of sin. They will learn both to will and to do righteousness. All who fail to learn that lesson will be judged unworthy of eternal life. 
Now, when the apostle wrote in Acts 17.31 that God had appointed the day in which he would judge the world in righteousness, the apostle recognized that they had not be begun in his day. Although 4,000 years of human history had passed when God sent his son into the world, it was still not time for the atonement day to begin. First, another important work had to be done. The work was to be the selection of Jesus' church, his bride, his footsteps followers who would reign with him in the kingdom. All this was to be an elite group called the glory, honor, and immortality. It does not mean that the most noble, the most talented, the most virtuous of the human race would be called. For as the Apostle Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 26, 29, Ye see your calling, brethren, call it not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Although God did not call the wise of the great or the learned, we are not to think from this that his people are base or ignorant in the sense of being evil or corrupt or debased. On the contrary, the Lord sets the highest possible standard before of those whom he calls. They are called to holiness, to purity, to faithfulness, and to principles of righteousness. But everywhere the Lord indicated that the path to this glory is a narrow one of trial, testing, and sacrifice. Revelation 20 verse 4 says that those chosen would live and reign within a thousand years in his millennial kingdom. Under these requirements, it would take 1845 years of the gospel race to select Jesus Church, those who would reign with him. The specific work of Jesus' first advent was from the babe in Bethlehem to his crucifixion and ascension was to redeem men. The work of Jesus' second advent is to restore, bless, and liberate the redeemed. Now having given his life a ransom, our Savior, for all our Savior ascended to present that sacrifice to the Father. <clears throat> for almost 2,000 years he tarried and permitted Satan, <coughs> excuse me, the prince of this world, to continue the rule of evil. Until after the selection of the bride, the Lamb's wife, his church, who to be accounted worthy of such honor, must overcome the influence <coughs> excuse me, of the present evil world. The period between the first and second advents between the ransom for all and the blessing for all is for the trial and selection of the church. For God had evidently designed the provision of evil for 6,000 years as well as the cleansing and restitution for all to be accomplished during the 7,000 years. We've heard a lot about that. So brethren, since 1872, we are in the 7,000th year. According to the plan, plan revealed in his word, God purposed to permit sin and misery to misrule and oppress the world in 6,000 years. And then in the seventh millennium to restore, restore all things by Jesus Christ, whom the apostles Paul said that God hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man who he hath ordained Jesus Christ the righteous. He was referring to this 1,000 day period also called the millennium. The thousand year is also called the day of judgment. <coughs> Now, the general false view of the Judgment Day is that Christ will come to earth, seated on a great white throne, and call saints and sinners before him to be judged. The entire time assisted to this stupendous work of judging billions is supposed to take to be a 24-hour day. The term day in the scriptures most frequently is used to represent any definite or special period of time. A judgment includes instruction, testing, correction, and sentencing. The plain declaration of the scripture is that there is nothing to dread in the day of judgment. Each will receive a full, fair trial by Jesus, the sympathetic high priest. In 1 Chronicles 16, 31, 34, David looked forward to the day of judgment. Here's what David said. <clears throat> Let the heavens be glad, and the earth rejoice, and let men say among the nations, Jehovah reigneth. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice, and all that are therein. Then shall the trees of the woods sing aloud at the presence of Jehovah, because he cometh to judge the earth. O oh, give thanks unto Jehovah, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. 
It is through this day of judgment that God is going to work in the atonement, the atonement between God and mankind through Jesus. Under the reign of Christ, mankind will be gradually educated, trained, disciplined until they reach perfection. Some will not get life. Acts 2.23 said that it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear their prophets shall be destroyed from among the people. Accordingly, as the 6,000 years of the reign of evil began to draw to a close, God permitted circumstances to favor discoveries. Discoveries in the study of his book, of both his book of Revelation and his book of nature, as well as in the preparation of mechanical and chemical appliances are useful in the blessing and uplift of mankind during the millennial age. The prophecy in Daniel 12.14 foretold this that Michael, Jesus, the great free, for prince, shall stand up and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, and to shut the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall come to and fro, and knowledge shall be, in, knowledge shall be increased. <clears throat> the present multiplication of inventions and other blessings of increasing knowledge if permitted in this day of, of the preparation. The millennial age began in 1872, <coughs> excuse me, and according to the chronology, Jesus returned in 1874. Now how fast things develop. At the end of the Civil War in the U.S. in 1865, there wasn't a telephone <coughs> in the United States anywhere or else in the world. Now we have the ubiquitous cell phone. No wires. It's, uh, you wonder how the airwaves can hold all the messages. It's a favorite toy of the kids. Our grandkids taught us to text. So I was going to try my, you know, my expertise on texting. I, act, I text my grandson. He said, I'm asking, he said, LOL. I said, call him up and said, Zach, what does LOL L -O -L mean? He said, it means laugh out loud. I don't know if you'd like to get here for me. <laughs> in, in 1874, or um, at the end of the Civil War, in 1865, also there was no radio, no television, no typewriters, no auto, automobiles. Now we have computers. It draws the world together instantly, in a flash, in an instant. The U.S. was mainly an agricultural country, and the people were still harvesting their crop with scythes and sickles. It required a good team of horses from dawn to dusk to plant two acres of land. When I was a teenager, I worked with the, uh, in a harvest in the Midwest with teams of horses. My brother-in-law and sister live on a farm in Nebraska. We're going to visit them. With their equipment, they can practically plant a whole hundred circle of corn with 130 acres in two days. And with a combine, they can practically uh, harvested in the same amount of time. My nephew told me they have a device. It's hooked to the combine. It's from the global positioning satellite. It takes the perimeter of the field. It will uh, program the combine to do its own thing. I said, what do you do? He said, I sit in there and watch television or read or, 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 or I hope he wouldn't pull him away, but I think they do have a device. <laughs> now, a favorite mode of travel in those after the Civil War was horseback or carriage. We discussed this in uh, class, and somebody pointed out that the fastest means of communication was the drum, and the fastest means was on horseback, travel was horseback. There were trains, I looked in encyclopedia, there were trains in the U.S., they steam drawn trains, but they were very few and very rare. The first practical typewriter came in 1874. The electric light, some years after that. Now some say the electric light has been the most beneficial invention for mankind. Now, uh, the first 14 years of my life, I used a kerosene ladder. And my wife, Betty, used a a kerosene lamp on the farm. No, no electric light. I remember in uh, eight, 1948, they had the RAA, the Rural Electrification Association, where they took electricity to all the farms. 
up to that time, none of the farms, you know, these towns had electric, but none of the farms had it. And that was a great boon for the farmers. So things were developing quite fast. It, uh, <coughs> the increase of knowledge had not only given the world wonderful labor-saving machine ranching region, but it has also led to an increase of medical skills whereby thousands of lives are prolonged. New transplant, new set, new uh, lens in my eye this year. I got a new year, knee two years ago. <laughs> what, what, amazing, amazing. The lens, the lens took a half an hour to do. War is becoming less popular because of human enlightenment, so thousands are spared to multiply the race more rapidly. Thus, while mankind is multiplying the necessity for man's labor is decreasing. So the leaders have a problem to provide the employment and sustenance of this rapidly increasing class whose service have been supplemented by machinery, but whose needs and wants know no bounds. Does that sound familiar? This was written by Pastor Russell in 1886, so he had insight on the times we're going through now. This uh, favorite mode of travel on horseback or carriage, my grandmother was born in 1886. She lived to be 104. In her lifetime, she went from the horse and buggy to the jet airplane. She would say, my goodness, how things pass things are happening. And she said, I can't believe what's happening. The prophet Daniel is quoted above, links together the increase of knowledge and the time of trouble. The knowledge causes the trouble because of the depravity of the race. Selfishness will continue to control the wealthy who hold the power and advantage. Selfishness will also control the poorer classes with an increased knowledge of their rights. And an instinct of self-preservation will result in a great time of trouble. The day of trouble will end in due time when he who spake to the raging sea of Galilee will likewise with authority command the sea of human passion, saying, Peace, be still. When the prince of peace shall stand up in authority, a great calm will resolve. Now Jesus and his church will have absolute control. I, 1 Timothy 6.15 reads, which in his time he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Galatians 4.4 4 reads, Wherefore God hath highly exalted and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, both of things in heaven and things on earth. No other man-made religions will hold sway over the people as they do today. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. And in the reign of Christ just began, all the families of the earth will be blessed. One wonders how this will all be played out. When the Apostle Paul finished his discourse at Athens on Mars Hill, Acts 17, 34 records, and they, when they heard of the resurrection, some mocked. We still have skeptics. I, I found this in my paper. Many universes, no God needed. This is a famous scientist. He said, many universes, no God needed. He says it, it just came together by itself. This, Clever scientists could be asked the same question that God asked Job. Where were thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? <laughs> Skeptics about him. I used to work with a man. He said, Kenny, when you're dead, you're dead. I said, you'll see, Kenny. He said, that's it. When the resurrection of the dead will begin, we know it will no doubt have an impact on people. Brother Ed brought that up. Jesus gave an example of this when he raised Lazarus. What happened? The resurrection of the dead and favorable condition will bring about the atonement. The Son of Man became a man and gave man's rest in Christ, that is, a reward for the sacrifice, and in order to the completion of the great work of atonement, he was highly exalted, even to the divine nature. And in due time, he will bring pass to pass a restitution of the race to the original perfection and to every blessing then possessed. These things are clearly taught in the scriptures from beginning to end. At the close of the millennial age, the world will be fully back in divine favor, fully at one with God as mankind 
was representative of one in harmony with God in the person of Adam before transgression entered the world. But additionally, they will possess a most valuable experience of evil, for by it they will have learned a lesson on the sinfulness of sin and the desirableness of righteousness. Additionally, also, they will possess an increase of knowledge and wider exercise of various talents and abilities, which were man's originally in creation, but in an undeveloped state. All of the holy angels will have profited by witnessing the illustration of divine justice, wisdom, love, and power in a measure they could not have conceived. And the lesson fully learned by all, we may presume, will stand for all time applicable to other races yet uncreated in other planets of the wide universe. And what will be the center of that story? It shall be told throughout eternity. It will be the story of the great ransom finished at Calvary and the atonement based upon the giving of that corresponding price which will demonstrate that God's love and justice exactly are exactly equal. And in closing, I'll read this from 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it, as, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Thank you.